it's the 21st. My God, the month is spooky season. It's coming to an end. <laughs> so that's that's how you know when life is getting you down. Oh, they they gave us three. Good good for them. I hope they enjoyed their movie. I just got back from the Monster Fest. It is time to talk about the movies that I watched this past month. My God, how many... I'm, I'm on the 21st currently of, uh, of October, uh, at least for the next seven minutes. Uh, I've watched 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38. And the month's not even over. This video is going to take forever. Okay, some of these are going to be my Hooptober ones. The ones that are in my Hooptober, I'm only going to give a star rating and move on because honestly, they're in my Hooptober video. Uh, so let's start with Doctor Who and the Daleks. It's in my Hooptober video. I gave it two and a half stars. It's okay. 4K transfer, marvelous. Saw. Thank God I added this to my Hooptober. I gave it four stars. Thought it was really fun. You know what? Go check out my calm, relaxed talk. I did a whole video talking about all the Saw movies. It was fantastic. I loved it. It was a wonderful experience, except for like two of the, of the movies were not great. But the rest of them I loved. So hey, there you go. Technically, three of them I didn't like, but the, who cares? The second one I'm still up in the air about. Then I watched The Creator. I did that in the cinema because my mate was like, hey, we've got to watch it and it's in widescreen because they do that still. The movie's okay. I gave it three and a half stars. It's like, yeah, sure, it's a ripoff of like all these other great movies you've already seen before. But hey, you know, he knows how to shoot a good looking movie, except for the fact there's two DOPs. But, you know, it looks like what if Star Wars was real, you know, that kind of bullshit. And good visual effects. It was a nice touching story, but it was also like very on the nose, very obvious. Oh, wow, Gemma Chan. I hope she doesn't come back later after getting killed in the first act. Um, oh, wow, this child. I wonder if it's hit. It's, uh, it's everything that was a twist was like so easily predictable in the first two minutes of the movie. So it's like, I know it's not what it's going for, but it's also like, yeah, I don't know. Still, it was good. I enjoyed it. I thought it was nice. Uh, watch Saw 2, gave it two and a half stars. Probably should maybe watch it again and give it a bit more of an upscale, but that's okay. Watch Saw 3, gave it th four stars. Boy, that's where the franchise gets kicking into next gear. Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell, I also watched for my Hooptober. You know, I'm going to go, this is going to take a look. Uh, three and a half stars. Great, watch the second site release. It was fun. Um, really good with special features. Uh, I watched Diary of the Dead. Uh, gave it three stars. That's in my Romero video. <laughs> Holy shit. Come and relax talk about the Romero video of the films. The first video is talking about the six zombie films he did. The second video is talking about the remakes and the, the sequels and the reboots. Not all of them, but just the ones that I've seen and can access. So, yeah. The main heavy hitters, basically. I didn't talk about the Dead Bloodline, I'm sorry. I didn't talk about Night of the Living and Animated. I didn't even reference it. I forgot it existed. I remembered, but I was also like, who cares? So then I watched Saw 4, three and a half stars. Fun stuff. Uh, Survival of the Dead, three stars. It's better than Diary, but um, yeah, still fun stuff. I like them. I like those films. Saw 5, two and a half stars. Boy, this is a hell of a chore to get through. It's half of it's fun, half of it isn't. Um, Saw 6, all of it's fun, four stars. Loved it. Saw X wonderful stuff. I actually started watching Urban Legend, got like 45 minutes in, was like, okay, I gotta leave. My screen of Saw X is in 15 minutes. Gotta go. Went there, had a quick bite to, de uh, to eat while I was waiting in line to buy the tickets because I didn't want to pay an extra dollar fifty for the goddamn online ticketing charge. Bunch of bullshit, that is. And uh, I loved it. I was in like the third row because I'm like, screw all these people. I'm sitting at the front. And the one benefit of having seen so many movies now with Guy is that we've, like, figured out if you sit in the first four rows, you can have a lot more fun because it's not like, oh, yeah, I'm sitting all the way back here. It's like, yeah, but that person's on their phone. Those people were talking. You've got more people around you eating popcorn and shit because movies suck. I hate the cinema sometimes. We had two... I had at least three people walk out during the movie. It was one of all. Saw Rex, great. Uh, that was the one I was meant to be talking about. I gave that one four stars. Loved it. Uh, but then I got home and finished watching Urban Legend, which I thought was really good, part of my Hooptober. Um, I gave it three stars, it's like, it would have been better as an Exodus Files episode, is what I said in my review, so, hey, there you go. The, Billy the Kid vs. Dracula, 
A Star and a Half. Not a good movie. It's on YouTube. It's for free. You can watch it. It's a piece of shit. It's not worth watching. Don't waste your time. Saw 3D. That was as the final chapter. Pretty good. It, it could have been a lot goddamn better if they had have actually let the writers be, make it a, a double feature. But then maybe we wouldn't have gotten... We would have still gotten Saw X, probably. I mean, maybe, but... Saw X is a set between the first and second film, so what does it matter? <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, I thought it was still pretty good. So, you know. Uh, then I watched Obsession, again, part of my hoop Um It was good. It was a good De Palma, very much a clear inspiration, and it's clearly inspired by Hitchcock's works, but uh, it was good. Transfer was nice, the hour video release. It's good stuff. It was one of their first releases, so like the first like five minutes of the disc is like all these ads about Arrow Video, like this is what Arrow Films is, and I'm like, yeah, I know. Why are you telling me? Like I haven't been buying your Blu-rays for the past, you know, five years, and it turns out, oh, this Blu-ray came out like almost fifteen years ago. Oof. Oh boy, <laughs> maybe thirteen years ago. It was like in, like 2011 or something. So, but still, you know, that's still good. The fact that they haven't like done a 4K UHD for that is kind of insane. But I guess maybe they don't have the rights. I don't know. I had their version of Dress to Kill. So uh, I also watched Obsession Revisited, which is their little like 55 minute long featurette doco, which was very informative. Um, I watched Jigsaw, gave it two stars. Not a good movie. Uh, it might be better on rewatch, but I did not like it that much. I didn't like its visual style. I didn't like... Uh, how confusing it was as to, is this the prison? Is this guy still alive? What's going on? I don't know. Then I watched Spiral from the Book of Saw. There apparently is a Book of Saw. I gave it three and a half stars. Pretty good. Then I watched The Trouble with Harry. That one I expected to be a horror because it was for my Hooptober. It turns out it was a comedy. Uh, that, 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 I should wish I hadn't known that going in. I would have watched Shadow of Doubt. But uh, no, it's still a good film. I hadn't watched it, so I, w I was happy about that. It was... Very amusing. There was a great suspenseful moment, like, whole sequence, like, right, like, in the last ten minutes in the movie, and I was like, you know what? It's worth it for that in terms of, like, that whole suspense thriller element. As in, like, adding it to Hooptober, that is. It's good watching the movie overall anyway. Um, I watched Shivers, part of Hooptober as well, which was on the same day. I must have been busy the day before. No? Ah, the day before I watched the two, um, Sp Jigsaw and Spiral, so, yeah, sure. So, uh, I watched Opera, four and a half, I gave it four stars, pretty damn good Argeno, I forgot that it existed and was like, hey, I've got this Blu-ray that is like a 2K master, apparently it took them like 140 hours to do the color grading edit. It's good, the sound design's atrocious, but hey, it's fine, the, the color, it looks fantastic, has some t tremendous sequences, a really great visually inventive tense sequence set in an apartment, wonderful stuff. Uh, I watched The Truman Show, gave it five stars. My partner had never seen it. I actually went and I was watching opera. She was late to, for me to pick her up, so I watched the first hour of opera. She sent me a message, hey, I'll be at the station in 10 minutes. I headed off, went and picked her up, came back. I finished opera, and then it's like, great, what are we watching next? So we watched Truman Show because she'd never seen it before. Uh, honestly, I'd never even added it to my letterbox, so I'm like, God, it's a five-star movie. It's just good stuff, you know? Then we watched, I introduced her to Return of the Living Dead because she had not seen that before. I gave it four and a half stars. I watched the Screen Factory 4K UHD. It looked divine. Uh, with the original mono mix or whatever original mix they had. But I also added the zombie subtitles to it because I thought that might be fun. Uh, it's a bad gimmick. Because it's just gurs and uhs, and it doesn't actually match with any line of dialogue being said. And it's like, there are actual zombies saying stuff like, send more cops. And they don't even have that. I'm like, that's a zombie talking. Why isn't that like a, I don't know, zombie sub subtitles? Waste of potential. Like, the, the, the font and everything was nice, but it just became distracting. Because I'm like, I'm seeing ahs and ers on the screen, and I'm not seeing any of that being replicated by what's actually happening on the screen. Oh, by what I'm hearing, it just wasn't wasn't smart. Who cares? Weird gimmick. Then on Friday the 13th, I watched Freaky from 2020. I gave it three and a half stars, part of my uh, Hooptober. But then I introduced Helene to Friday the 13th, part eight, Jason Takes Manhattan. Gave it three stars. I still like it. It's 
I have always liked it. It's like the first hour is what if Jason's on a boat and he's like doing an alien and he's just killing people one by one by one. It's great. The first 45 minutes is like, ah, people hanging out on the boat doing their soap opera lives. Meanwhile, Jason keeps killing them. Then it's like, ah, Jason's on this boat. We gotta like go and kill him. And then it's like, nope, we're gonna blow up the boat and and, and sail to to Manhattan, and then he just swims and follows them. You know what? I don't even think he swims. I think he just gets to the bottom of the ocean and walks. But uh, I, I liked it. I watched We watched the Screen Factory edition, which I haven't seen any of those releases yet, and I've got the whole box set. Uh, and it was just... Well, it was a nice print. I had no complaints. Um, I did watch some of the special features after it. There was a whole, like, uh, couple of interviews and stuff, but there was no... Um, nothing to let, log on letterbox. Then on the Saturday, we watched Beyond the Door at the uh, Cinemaniacs. Uh, Handy did a presentation. It was really cool. Um, it is a very weird film, but I was able to enjoy it with Caitlin, which was really nice. Uh, I gave it three stars. It's <laughs> it's a really tough movie to watch. Like It can be really, really boring and can be an absolute snooze fest, but then the dialogue comes in, and you're like, this is the funniest shit I've ever seen. Um, it, it has some great sequences to it, so... Yeah, it's worth watching. I, I would suggest it. There's an Arrow video release. I believe we watched that because it was like the uncut English version, also known as like the door of... the something of Satan. What's it called? Uh, no, the devil within her. It, it's not a... It's, it's fun. It's stupid, but it's fun. Then I watched The Mother of Tears, part of my Hooptober as well. Just an Argeno film. Uh, not a good Argeno film. I gave it two stars. I'm like, wow, an actually bad Argeno film. Well, at least I'm not watching any more of his, except for I've got two Evil Eyes on 4K to watch, and I, I plan to watch eventually when I get it. Um, that four flies on Grey Velvet, I would love to watch that. So, yeah, but I don't think I'll watch anything else of his. I'll just rewatch the stuff I've already got. I'm like, I think, I, I think I've covered every basis now. There might be one or two I'm missing in between, but I'm pretty sure I've covered every basis. Because um, Mother of Tears was just not good. But I covered that up by jumping on that Criterion channel and watching Arsenic and Old Lace. I gave it four and a half stars. I loved it. I was like, oh my god. It's funny. Oh, it was so funny. I, I feel like I really needed a funny film because I adored it. It was so funny. My dad, the next day, got the DVD out to, so he could watch it. Even though I'd watched like this new scan that looked tremendous. That was on the Criterion channel. I'm like, I need to buy that bloody Blu-ray. i got to get that Criterion. It looks amazing. Yeah, it was just an insane film because I'm like watching it. I'm like, yeah, it's just a ride. It's like, it's, it's amusing, but it's like, what's the catch? You know, it's just a guy, he's got, he's a bachelor, he advertises how marriage is a scam, and then he gets married, and then you think it's going to be him on his honeymoon, and then he finds a dead body in his aunt's house, and it's like, oh, okay then, things are getting interesting, and uh, it just goes from there. So yeah, and then on the 16th, I did a double feature again, I watched The Endless, uh, the Arrow Video Blu-ray, this was for my... Hooptober, I gave it four stars. I have not watched any of their films except for like the episodes they've done of Moon Knight of all fucking things. Um, I mean, look, they get their paycheck. That's good enough. I need to watch their other films. I would suggest watching their other films, especially the one that came before this one. But at the same time, The Endless is a good start. It was really interesting. I love that kind of... There's a big evil presence and we're not going to really physically show it but show the effects of it. And I love that sometimes more than the thing itself. Uh, very Lovecraftian. Uh, I, I like the low-budget feel as well, because it was low-budget. It, it was great. I, I really liked it. Um, then I watched Dr. X on the Criterion channel. It was like an hour and... Okay, it was 76 minutes. It was actually longer than I expected. I gave it three stars for a 1932 film. It's interesting. It's interesting to see a pre-Wizard of Oz color, uh, film in colour, because a lot of people are like, No, Wizard of Oz is the first movie in colour. It isn't. Color was like around since like the like 1904, you know. <laughs> it was just like a color palettes adding to the actual image, whether it was gels or whatever, or or it was the uh, eventual two strip Technicolor, which this film was, and it was like it had these weird green and like yellow hues and whatever. And I was like thinking like like green like to the emphasis of Technicolor green again, very much like uh, Wizard of Oz, and I was like thinking. Is there something wrong with the scan? What the hell is this? And I, I did a brief like look into it and they're talking about two strip technicolor. I'm like, oh, okay, it's meant to look like this. That's cool. It does work. It's got a good style. 
the first half is kind of meh, but the second half when they're like uh, actually at this like the scientists like basically manor house whatever holiday home and they're like doing the thing tests where it's like oh we've got a test of the, which one of us is a murderer i'm like this is actually pretty fun and it's got a really interesting twist so um yeah it, it's just the first half is really like luster and they try to emphasize this oh it's this detective he's really funny and uh, no this this reporter and he's really funny and he's gonna get to the bottom of it by accident but also on purpose and i'm like i don't really care <laughs> but it's all right then I watched I Trapped the Devil, part of my Hooptober. I gave it two stars. Waste of a time. 80 minutes. Yikes. I've had that Blu-ray for like, I, I, since like August last year or something. Like the Blu-ray.com app actually has it logged down as to when I got it. I'm pretty sure I got it for like 10 bucks. Still probably isn't even worth that. I would not suggest it. It just feels like a bad ripoff of Stranger Things and also anything interesting. Uh, apparently there's a Twilight Zone episode that's a lot better, I would suggest that instead, but again, part of my Hooptober. Then I watched Not a Living Dead, the remake. Uh, I gave her three stars, part of my, um, my Romero Dead Part 2 video. Go check that out. Um, then I watched The Devil's Candy, which these, was the last of my Hooptobers. I gave it four stars, I really enjoyed it. I watched the Umbrella Blu-ray release. It's a really fun movie. It was a part of a, f a film that Phil and Katie had suggested, and... I really liked it, so yeah. I like having friends who have really varied taste in movies. It's great. And they're like, you gotta watch this one. It's great. You gotta watch this one. It's great. My mate Guy keeps telling me to watch these TV shows. I'm like, I don't have time for TV shows. Stop suggesting The Shield. And so I've bought The Shield. Now I've got to have to watch The Shield when it comes in. Oh my god. Uh, anyway. I did the Dawn of the Dead remake. It was fun. Three and a half stars. I did the Day of the Dead remake. It was not good, but it was fun. I gave it two stars. I thought it was fun and I liked it because it was stupid and enjoyably stupid. Um, but a lot of people are just like, this film is an insult to film. And I'm like, yeah, it is. But it's also like really dumb and funny. Uh, I don't think it's purposely funny. I think it's just bad funny. So, yeah. Then I watched Killers of the Flower Moon. I gave it five stars. It is currently my favorite film of the year. It was heartbreaking. For the long run time it has, it did not feel it. The music was exceptional. It was funny when the music wasn't on, I could hear the, the bass from the Taylor Swift concert next door. That wasn't fun, but it didn't detract from the movie. I thought the performances were amazing. Lily Gladstone is tremendous. Leo, I've, I haven't seen him this good in the movie in a long time, and most of the time he was doing a frowny face for the whole fucking movie. Uh, it, was, it was really good. The cinematography was, was amazing. It's just... It was just a really powerful and f well-made film. Uh, I've put it as my favorite of the movie so far, my favorite movie of the year so far, just because it's like, I just really loved it. Uh, God knows if I'm gonna rewatch it anytime soon. But it's also currently my favorite Scorsese, I'm thinking. Like, it's either that or like After Hours, uh, or like King of Comedy, so. He's a tough director for me because I don't always love his works. I appreciate him and his works, but I don't always love him as a director because I'm like, I don't really care that much for a lot of his films. I appreciate them being around and I appreciate what he has done for cinema and what he's done for, like, not just his own films and insp inspiring other films, but, like, what he's done for, you know, helping cinema. So it's like, yeah, but no, it's, it's he's still a will really well God, He's still got it. <laughs> This is the first time I've actually been like, I think I genuinely love this film. I haven't really had that for most of his films, except for like King of Comedy and um, After Hours. So yeah. Um, and then I watched tonight, Satan Wants You, which I didn't even give a review, uh, which is a documentary, technically a satanic panic uh, doco from that I watched the Monster Fest. It was good. It was insightful for someone like myself who is not big on... I'm not a huge history buff from the Satanic Panic stuff, so I'm not very well versed, and this was literally a, hey, these are the two people who created it, let's kind of explore how fucked up their lives were, and how fucked up it was for everyone around them, but also explore what they started, where it came from, was it truthful, was it false, what it led to in the media in America, how we're reflecting it to the current day with stuff like, you know, with QAnon and stuff like that, so it was like, it was really interesting for that. I gave it four stars. I I think it's more or less like a three and a half star documentary because it's it's got that kind of like 
good energy to it. It's got that like nicely well directed stuff. It's still talking head, but it's it's well shot. It's like well edited. You've got great like setups of like old like recreations of scenes that would have happened, but with obviously not the same actors, not the same people that the actors pretending to be them. But they're like using like lens blares and stuff like the blues and stuff to to blur out the faces to make it look more like it's actually them. It's it's nicely done, but it also was really funny because this is one cop who's just. The funniest guy, but they also look really goofy with their 70s and 80s haircuts. So with an audience, it was really funny. Uh, and that's all I've watched so far in the month. What else have I watched for my birthday and stuff? Skaboosh. So as we continue with what we've watched in October, uh, last clip was in Saturday, so it is Sunday. So on Sunday, I did a double feature on the Criterion channel. I watched... Freaks from 1932, the Todd Browning film. Uh, I double featured it with The Black Cat from 1934, both pre-code black and white horror films. I gave them both four stars. Um, they both have very different effects to me. So Freaks, I thought was a lot more emotional. It was obviously one of those, oh, this, the, the original scary factor of it is how uh, disabled people, freaky deaky, let's get spookumed. Uh, obviously it doesn't really seem like that was Todd Browning's original intent because you watch it and it's like, yeah, he's not really ridiculing them. He's not showing them the scary things. Clearly the regular public who go to freak shows would be scared of them. But then you watch it and it's like, actually it's just showing them living their normal lives. It never shows them in the freak show setting. Like it never shows them being puppeteered or on display to be mocked or ridiculed, which was really nice. Um... The drama that it had, the stories, it's only like a 64 minute long film because they cut it down because the studio are a bunch of chumps. But it did have the original ending that ended with uh, after the reveal of the flash, after the, the, because it starts with a carnival and it's like, oh, look at this thing. Let's tell us, let's tell you the backstory of this, this new attraction. It is a scene that happens after that, which is really, really nice. Um... Yeah, I thought it was just really well done. It was really, it was very emotionally captivating. There is a really terrifying sequence uh, in the last, like, ten minutes of it, um, which was just really well captured. It, it's like, it reminded me a lot of Toy Story when the kids go, when the toys go off the Sid. So I kind of feel like that was what that was kind of referencing in a way. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting. It was, it put the, the, the freaks in a fearful light for one particular scene because like but within a context that made sense like these people are trying to use and abuse us we're going to take our revenge um and it was really powerful so uh, i would definitely suggest freaks uh it's just it seems a little too short for me um to give it the five star perfect film masterpiece but also because there are some minor subplots that don't seem wrapped up like you've got the bearded lady who they rarely reference they're like oh she's got a kid and that's it but I think it's just more to show them having a life. But then there's also the two-headed girl. Well, not two-headed girl. Like the Siamese twins, whatever they call it. Which the conjoined twin. Um, I don't think Siamese twin is an appropriate term to use anymore. But the conjoined twin. Um, and one's dating one guy who's getting they're engaged to get married. And the other twin hates the guy. <laughs> and then you've got the complete opposite. Where that twin that hates the, you know, that isn't married. Is dating this other guy who's a lot more romantic and nice and sweet. And they both seem to like him, but the other one who's engaged doesn't want to, like, admit it, but visually it's there. Uh, that was really interesting. They didn't go too much into it. They didn't really resolve it. They kind of did by saying, oh, we'll, we'll get to know each other, because, like, as in the two male partners, because it's like, well, they kind of will have to probably live in it. They make it seem like it's t it's two different people, like, as if they're not conjoined. At all, like, they are clearly two different people, but it's just so interesting that they don't make it seem like they are. Like, both guys are pretending that, like, they're just sisters who drag each other around all the time. Like, it's a metaphor or something. I don't know. It's it's really interesting. The Black Cat, on the other hand, I didn't find its interest... It's, I didn't find its narrative to be, or characters to be, as emotionally investing. But its style of horror and the kind of stuff that they do is really, really interesting and very dark. It also looks gorgeous. Legosi is in it. He's great. Karloff is in it. He's great. The story, like when you realize what's actually happening and you're like, oh, this is really messed up. 
Uh, it's really, really insane. The fact that they call it the Black Cat is really lazy. The fact that he keeps jumping at Black Cats is kind of hilarious. Um, it's a really interesting picture. I would definitely recommend both of these. They're very different, but great versions of showing what you could show before you were told not to show anything. So, yeah, I'd, I'd recommend them. They're really good. But then I followed that up on the Monday, the 23rd. I did another double feature. These are all double features. I watched The Mist. I watched the 4K UHD. I watched the black and white version. Uh, it looked amazing. It. I've never seen it before. I gave it four and a half stars. I really, really liked it. I was... I knew what the ending was, which I won't say anything just in case you haven't seen it. I had seen the final scene before, and it obviously annoyed me, but, like, watching it, you kind of forget that that's going to happen, and even when you remember, it doesn't like being like, oh, I hate that this is going to happen. It's like, I didn't know who was going to be there in the final scene. Like, I'd forgotten, which is good. Um, but it's also, like, how they get to that stage, what happens to other people the journey was much more impressive and the ending was still just as impactful. So that new 4K UHD release, which has two 4K discs, one for the color version, one for the black and white version, and then the same for the Blu-rays, really good. I'm still yet to dig into the special features because they were only on the Blu-ray discs. It did have commentary tracks on the 4K discs, but I imagine the commentaries aren't aligned by uh, the color grading. But yeah, so I recommend them. It's, it's a good set and a fantastic film. I then watched Final Destination 2 with, on a group watch on like, Dis, was it Disney Plus or Netflix? I think it was Disney Plus um, with Guy and Bill and Simone. Simone dropped out halfway through to do other stuff. But I still enjoy this film. I gave it three stars. I've watched it three times now, which is ridiculous. Actually, I think this is the fourth no, the third time. I think it's the second, the third one I've watched two or three times. Um, I think I've watched the second one twice, the third one twice, this one three times. Um, yeah, because I've watched it when I did my initial come and relax talk doing the whole Final Destination series. I still give it the three stars. I still think it's a good film, but it's just, it has great kills. I don't care as much for the characters, but there's an in-between. There's an up and down. It's, it, it feels very rushed. There's a lot of exposition. There's a lot of tying things between the films. There's not as much role-playing stuff like, oh, we got to set up the rules. It's like, nah, we know the rules. Let's get into it. So there's a lot of stuff that's like that, but then there are also like all the intricacies of, oh, well, this person because of that. Like the amount of times I had to explain to my friends who were literally watching the same movie what the rules were because half of them, one of them was playing a video game. The other one was like, not paying attention that much, so I had to explain stuff while they were explaining other stuff. It got annoying, but uh, it, every time that we, we had a kill scene happen, it was great, and then sometimes we'd rewind it to just watch it again, because you can do that, and it's fun. Then, for my birthday, I watched Audition, the Arrow video release. I gave it five stars. I, it's a fantastic film. I know I've been tortur talking about the torture porn genre and whatever, but this is kind of, is really up there. Like, realistically, the last 20-odd minutes, holy shit. I, I know how brutal it gets. I knew from a gif that there was something already up with the girl. I won't detail plot-wise or anything else, but I forget how much of what happens before it is just simple stuff. But it was much more entertaining to watch this time around. I haven't seen it for, like, four or five years pre letterbox days. Um, I think in 2017, probably. And yeah, it was, uh, I didn't like it that much when I first watched it. I thought the last act was really good, but I didn't care for the early parts because I'm like, I don't understand what's happening. I don't give a, what, what? I, I didn't understand it. And then upon rewatch last night, because I figured I kind of had to, um, for my birthday, <laughs> um, it was just really good. It annoyed me a bit because I had to stop it in between uh, the really graphic parts to go have dinner. That was hilarious. Um, you'd think I would have lost my appetite, but no, I've seen it all before. It's all good. But then, you know, cause it was my birthday and we're like, oh, it's cake time. And I'm like, come on, there's like five minutes left on the runtime. But I paused the movie, went, had cake, came back in with a slice, click play. Two seconds later, cut to black. I'm like, oh, all right then the movie's done. I'd forgotten that the movie ended where it ends, like on that particular scene, on that particular shot. So I just rewound it a bit, rewatched that scene and then ejected the disc and went and had dinner. <laughs> so when I had my cake. 
But yeah, gave it five stars. And then I watched Psycho, the 4K UHD. I watched the uncut version, which I'd never seen before, all from that new set, which I would have shown off in my most recent This Week In for my birthday. Um, I gave this film four stars. It is a really good film for what it is. And it's obviously iconic. It's the start of the slashes, all this kind of stuff. Like it's one of those started so much stuff that is just tremendous. It's 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 noteworthy historical. For me, the film really loses itself on rewatch after the first forty five minutes. Once you get to the shower scene, the, that first forty five minutes is so well done. It's tense. It's beautifully crafted, and then. There's the motel, and it's still creepy. It's got a good vibe, or a creepy vibe, and all that stuff. And Anthony Perkins is tremendous. He's tremendous throughout the whole film. There's no doubt about that. The cinematography and the, the sound and the, the music. I only watched the 1.0 because I wanted to watch the original audio mix. I don't really do that too often, but I do like to do it every once in a while. Um, but I really like the experience of watching it. But the narrative, once it becomes a, oh, we got to figure out who the killer is and or what happened to Marin. I'm like, this doesn't work on rewatch because it's like, I know what the fuck happens. It's not as creepy. It's not as insane. It's still really great to watch the scenes because they're iconic, but it's like, it just doesn't have that as much of a draw as it used to, you know? On first watch, even knowing the shower scene, knowing that Norman Bates is the killer is one thing, but then once you get to that second half... It just loses that gravity, especially because Marion's just gone. She's the most interesting character. I know that Norman Bates is, but he's not the driving plot of the four. He's not the driving force of the plot. He becomes the driving force of the plot, which is still iconic and all that stuff, and it's a legendary thing for the film to do. But yeah, it's just really interesting to know that it's like, yeah, after she dies, it's like, I could turn it off or skip to the end, skip to the, you know, skip to every other kill or something, you know, but I, I want to watch the sequels, so we'll get around to that, hopefully later this week, if not sometime next month, Oof. anyway, that's, what else did I watch, okay, hello, we're back, all right, so, these are the last couple of days of October, I have watched a plentitude of films, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, Ten things I've logged, one being a video essay that's on Criterion Channel, one being a making of. But we'll just we'll just bang through it. So uh, on the 25th, I watched The Killer with my mate Guy. It, it was the, uh, ex I'd say exclusive, but I don't know if it was actually exclusive, but still a premiere-ish in Australia uh, at the Lido Cinema. Um, and that was really fun. It was... It's been a... I don't think I've ever seen a David Fincher film in a cinema before, so that was uh, really good. I don't think I would have understood half the jokes without the audience laughing, because sometimes... Uh, you know how you get sitcoms of canned laughter and whatever, but those are very obvious jokes. You just need the canned laughter to kind of boost it a little bit. Yeah, this is jokes like, oh, he's playing pop music that... Like, I think it was like the Ramones or something, like bands I don't really listen to and or haven't really explored in detail yet. So, like, people are being like, oh, that's so funny, he's listening to that song, why would a serial killer listen to that song, you know, that kind of stuff. But I absolutely loved it, I gave it four and a half stars, I, I loved its editing style, its pacing, its, uh, what was it, its sound design, it was immaculate. I, there was a great action scene, which is going to be one that I know people are going to complain about, because uh, <laughs> it's not on Netflix yet, it will be in like a week or two. It, the, there's an action scene that takes place in someone's house and it's dark. It's very dark, but it's also, it's not the kind of dark where they don't have a gaffer, it's the kind of dark where it's deliberate. Like, you can still make out the people because it's pretty obvious who's who, and it's mostly down to like the sound effects and the editing, and I love that. It's it's a very contrasty to John Wick style, where John Wick is very, you can see everything, it's colourful, single take shot kind of stuff, which is still fun, it still works very well, but that's caused a bit of an issue with a lot of action films where people are like, oh, there's too many cuts in this, it doesn't look like a John Wick film, it should be like John Wick. It's like, yeah, but does the film need that style? Does the editing amplify the action? Editing does amplify the action in this film, and I really loved it for that, because sometimes a really good action scene can just be edited really well. It doesn't have to be. Like, choreography is good, directing is good, but sometimes you don't realise that the editing needs to be there. If the editing ain't there... You take the clip from Taken 3 where he's jumping over a fence, it looks like crap because it's a hundred different takes. But there's a one, it's just it's just nicely edited. It's a really smart film, really fun film. Um, 
I suggest it. It'll be on Netflix soon if you couldn't catch it in cinema. You know, because that's what's happened with movies now. I showed my partner on the 26th the American Werewolf and American Werewolf in London. Uh, we watched the Arrow Video Blu-ray. This was the 4K transfer, not the 4K UHD, but still a divine transfer. I figured, look, she was coming over, spooky season. She's never seen it. And there are so many great films that I'm yet to show her. So it's like, hey, how about I show her the best werewolf film of all time? I gave her four and a half stars. I love it. It's one of my favorites. I still remember the first time Dad showed it to us as kids. It was like with Shaun of the Dead. He was like, hey, you guys really like that, except for me with that one really gory scene where a guy gets torn apart. And it's like, how about American Werewolf in London? One of the goriest films. <laughs> Not one of the goriest, but like... One of the most realistic gore, like, especially with, like, his mate, who's, like, constantly uh, becoming more of a corpse. It was a nightmare to watch as a kid. Uh, I don't think I ever finished it. Um, the kind of one where you hide in the bathroom while everyone else, while you can hear all the stuff happening. Uh, you don't realise how much of a comedy it is as a kid, but then you watch it as an adult and you're like, oh, it's funny because it's moon dance. Oh, it's funny. But also the sex scene. Holy crap, it's that great. And, um... Hottest nurse in, in film history? Yeah, probably. So, a good slew of stuff, and Helene liked it a lot. So, yeah, it was one of those things where it's like, she wasn't used, to, she's, she, I have to, like, show her different narrative styles so she can understand that film isn't as basic as a three-act structure Disney film. So, a lot of the time, like, I show her a film like this, and it, like, keeps changing in tone and tempo throughout, so, like, you know, and it is like that, but that's the point. It's, it's what makes it more interesting. Each act of the film is diverse and different and it keeps one-upping itself and then it just grows more it's like how you don't see the wolf until like basically the last 10 minutes of the movie it's it's fantastic so it's such a great effect she loved the transformation like when the transformations were happening on screen she was like oh that's cool you know like i love that she can respect the craft even if she's not understanding the feel and the vibe of the film she's seen the effects and what they're doing and she's appreciating that and i, I really like that about her <laughs> It's great, you know, she might not like the film, but she's like, hey, but those werewolf effects were great. So it's like, you know, fair enough. Well, the same night, I watched the making of Psycho. Uh, I watched it by myself. I was already almost finished it. I would watched the first hour, the I watched the first half an hour of my birthday, the next half an hour the day after, and then the final half an hour on uh, on the Thursday. It turns out you literally can just go into the special features on the 4K disc and just click play and it says, oh, do you want to watch all these individually or play all? You play all, you get the 90 minute feature and I just skipped through until the part I was up to because I didn't want it to keep loading every two to three minutes. So, yeah. But it was good. It was a really interesting and informative making of. It really sucks that Anthony Perkins wasn't in more of it. Uh, he was hardly in any of it, which really sucked because um, he would have been... It, it does say that he's in it for self-archive, but it's like, it's not really. It's just, it's just, he doesn't say anything. It's not like he was interviewed, so it's uh, disappointing. Um, but still, it's a really, really well done documentary, so uh, making of. So back in the, back in the, hey, we're going to make making of documentaries for DVDs and laser discs. Let's have some fun with it. Back in those days where they're really informative. So I don't know. Obviously check it out if you haven't seen it. Um, on the 27th, I introduced my friends. I had a private cinema screening for my birthday. I showed everyone a razor head. This included three people who had already seen it and three people who had, four people who had not, including Helene. Um, that was the main reason I wanted to show because I'm like, look, I want to show a film that's absolutely insane that I adore. Like, watching on the big screen, I'm loving it. You know, second time I've watched it on the big screen. <laughs> uh, even though the first time was the Astor, so it's an even bigger screen. And uh, it was wonderful. We watched in the cinema in Brunswick, which uh, the Hankel Street Cinema, if you uh, in Melbourne and want to book a cinema, go for it. No one else had booked the first cinema, so they gave us the first cinema as an upgrade. And uh, the guy was a big fan of Rose Head, so he had gotten a copy prior to it, but I had my Criterion ready. So, uh, yeah, it was wonderful. My mate Lachlan hated it. Uh, Bill fell asleep. Helene was very confused by it. She walked out at one point to go to the bathroom and miss the whole like song and dance number basically so I just like when the foot of film f finished I was like I want to show you my favorite scene of the film let's go back to that part so we watched that again but uh it was interesting my friend Simone was like 
This is the kind of film that I, I, I'm happy that I've watched it, but I will never watch it again. Don't ever show it to me again. <laughs> It's great. Like, you know it's good when it starts up and, like, Phil and Katie were there and Phil calls out. He's like, oh, God, I hope this isn't in black and white. I hope this film's in colour. Uh, it's, it's just good stuff. What did I do on the 28th? I don't even know what I did on the 28th, but I did not. Oh, I had parties. Right, I had social events because Halloween, birthdays, stuff like that. So I didn't watch any movies, but on the 29th, I did a, uh insane double feature. I watched The Entity, which Phil and Katie had lent me uh, on my birthday, and... Uh, it is really messed up. I still gave it four and a half stars because I think it's a really, really well-made film. Um, it's really, really messed up. Like, if you don't like the worst kind of sexual assault, uh, you won't like this film at all. I do not suggest it. But, uh, if you know what the basic premise is, that happens a lot in the movie. But then the movie just kind of changes itself as it goes. It's, it's basically a proto-poltergeist because it came out, like, on the same goddamn year. I think it came out... They're within weeks of each other, basically. Um, I think people didn't like the entity because it was too much like Poltergeist, even though Poltergeist had come out, I think, a few weeks earlier or something. That kind of 80s era where so many of the same films are coming out at the same time, you know? So, despite the fact that it did feel like Poltergeist, but it was like, hey, what if Poltergeist was really messed up? It's, it's kind of like that, and I kind of really like that about it. Uh, like, Poltergeist is iconic. It's a great film, but I kind of think the entity's better. Um... I mean, the poltergeist just have better effects, so... But yeah, the entity is really, really nightmarish. Like, genuinely terrifying. Because uh, you're just uncomfortable for the majority of the film. Like, you know, uh, I can see why Scorsese said it was, like, in his top 11 most scary films of all time. So, I agree. It's really up there, but it's got some terrific acting. I want to I wanna credit it because I kind of have to. Um, Barbara Hershey is amazing in the film, so... Yeah, but it's interesting. Um, on the twenty, on the same night, I <laughs> I watched Jason Goes to Hell the final Friday. I've never seen it. Um, this is the first time I watched it for my on my Scream Factory Blu-ray, and it was actually really fun. I had been watching Red Letter Media review each film, and I'm like, I don't really want spoilers for the film, so I might as well just watch it. And I did, and I really dug it. I know it's like it is one of those. A bad Friday the 13th film, but a good non-Friday the 13th film. It's like Halloween 3, you know? Like, Halloween 3 is a bad Halloween film, but I adore Halloween 3 because it's not a Halloween film. The fact that they went anthology, I think, works a lot better. Obviously, this doesn't go for that boat. This one's like, hey, let's go for lore and mythos and all that stuff. And then uh, Jason also body swaps. It's it's insane. Obviously, people had con comparison it to The Hidden, and the director had never seen The Hidden. I watched that whole like, interview with him, because I watched the unrated cut, and it's really fun, but the interview with him was really interesting, that the, the, the Screen Factory disc was fantastic, it had an interview with, uh, uh, Kane Hodder as well, which was really interesting, um, but the interview with the director was really good, uh, finding out that he was, like, 23 when he made it, and he was just, like, childhood friends with the Cunninghams, and they were like, hey, do you want to do a, a Jason film? And he's like, yeah, I want to do a Jason film. But he was also like a big horror guy. He loved all the other Jason films. He loved it, like Evil Dead and a bunch of other stuff. So you can see all the inspiration worked within it. Like, sure, it's a bad Friday the 13th film. But honestly, I don't really care. Because it's like you're watching it and you're like, having seen eight of them by that stage, I've seen all of them now. But, you know, if you're going for chronology, it's like, wow, the last few of them were kind of dull and repetitive, but then, you, like, they, they all had their little extra tick-ups, like, like, part seven is really dull, but hey, you've got, it's Freddy versus Carrie, so that's the fun part of it, but that's only the end, uh, but then the second film, I think that was the one that was cut off a lot of its special effects, I think, but Jason does look fantastic in that film, um, I, I like Jason Takes Manhattan as well, I don't think it's a fantastic film, but I do enjoy it, like, it's Jason on a boat, it's like Alien, and he's in Manhattan, and it's really fun, because he's just, the place looks like shit, um, but like, you, it's all the same repeated formula, and then you get Takes Manhattan, and it's like, no, this is constantly on the go, there's so many characters, there's so many moving parts, it's insane, so I gave it three and a half stars, uh, it's no masterpiece, but it's one of my favourite of the franchise, surprisingly. I guess it's like with Halloween. I like when there's something different. 
you know, and knowing that everyone hated it, and everyone's like, no, don't watch it, it's a waste of your time, and then I watched it, and I'm like, this was not a waste of my time, it has amazing effects, it has an insane plot, insane characters, Jason is ridiculous in it, I absolutely adore it, it is bizarre, um, so if you can kind of, like, distance yourself from the fact that it's a Friday the 13th film, because it isn't, the li they didn't have the licensing anymore. They had the license to Jason. That's why it's called Jason Goes to Hell the Final Friday because it's not Friday the 13th. Um, so keep that in mind, I guess. But also Jason X comes right after. And Jason X is really fun. It's Freddy vs. Jason. They're like arguably th maybe three of the best ones or at least three of the most diverse. Uh, and I, I really like that about it. So those two with like maybe part two, part four, and part six. Yeah. There's a good variety of stuff in there. I don't know. If you don't like it, you don't like it. I don't give a shit. <laughs> um, on the 30th, because of obviously I'd watched Jason Goes Hell, I'm like, I should watch The Hidden. I have the Blu-ray. So I watched The Hidden. I've had the Blu-ray for like a year now because I saw her still on Twitter, which was, hey, have you ever seen that film with Carl McLaughlin as a flamethrower? Kind of a bit of a spoiler, isn't it? Um, but I didn't know when he was going to use the flamethrower and then watching the film, I'm like, I know when he's going to use the flamethrower, but I'm just waiting for it, you know? Uh, it was fun. It's like more of a sci-fi thriller, not really a horror, but it's the same body swapping thing. It's really fun. Carmen Walker's great in it. The effects are interesting. A lot of it's t uh, uncreative in the fact that it's just constant shootouts. And it's like they're just shooting someone who can't die. That kind of gets a little boring. Like I like that it transfers it transfers bodies a, a lot, and you get different versions of each thing, and that's really fun. Um, but yeah, so it's so crazy how that dog just jumped through that door and just knocked the guy over. So uh, weird, weird movie. Uh, I recommend it. It's pretty fun. On the same day, I watched... Oh, these are all two on the same day, all on the 30th. Uh, I watched Cure on the Criterion channel. This is the, what, Kurosawa film? Yeah. Um, Kiyoshi. I've yet to watch Pulse, but Cure was... Phenomenal. I gave it four and a half. I imagine I'll give it five on rewatch because it's one of those ones that you will appreciate it more and more on rewatch. You'll notice more and more things. I did watch the video essay, There Is No Cure, which was actually done by a guy I'm not that much of a fan of, Alexandre O'Philip. Uh, he did do, I've seen his documentary on memory, which I thought was kind of meh. It's like, it's information I've seen before. It's not that great. And then he Apparently, I don't know, whether or not you like Leap of Faith, um, which I'm yet to watch, the Exorcist doco, or 7852, which is the Hitchcock doco, or the People vs. George Lucas, which I have not seen. Um, but I'm interested in the Lynch Oz one, which is on the Criterion channel, but uh, I don't know. I was not a big fan of Memory. I didn't think that this was a very good video essay. Uh, it's more of a, hey, let's spoil a bunch of other films, and then we'll talk about Cure. Um, it does mention a few things that were very interesting. Um, stuff that I hadn't noticed that I'm like, I could literally just watch a top 10 things you didn't notice in Cure video on, on, on you know YouTube, and I get the exact same experience. So if you have the Criterion channel and it's there, or it's on the Criterion disc, I might, buy, might be on the disc, Sure, it's only 17 minutes, but it does spoil a lot of older movies, so that might annoy you, um, and it kind of did. But I also, like, didn't really think about it while I was watching it. I just wanted to know what he was talking about. So, yeah, but Cure was fantastic. I was still kind of dwelling on it and, like, tr entranced by it um, for the rest of the night to the point that I was not going to watch another film. I'm like, I want to, but I'm like, I'm just going to go edit instead because I cannot get this film out of my head. I don't want to bury it with, like, Jason X. So my last one for the month, which I watched on Halloween, was Army of Darkness. I watched it uh, with Helene because she has never seen it before. She wanted to watch a Halloween film, but then, you know, a movie for Halloween, basically. And maybe not the best choice, not really horror, but it is horror in technicality. Um, but we put on the theatrical cut because I wanted to, with the Screen Factory 4K I have, which I have not yet seen, I hadn't yet until this point. I'm like, I'll put on the director's cut because it's the better version, but it was 96 minutes. We had to go out after, you know, we had trick-or-treaters coming by eventually. We would have to go out for dinner. We were going to go to the Tim Burton themed bar. It was like, it wouldn't have benefited us to do the longer version. And the theatrical cut, which was on the 4K disc, was 81 minutes. So I'm like, we'll put that on then, you know? It got to the point that we're like 20 minutes in and she's like, 
wait, so is this a Halloween film? Film, And I'm like, I mean, not really. But And she's like, why are we watching it? I'm like, because you wanted to watch a short horror movie. And this is technically horror. <laughs> and you've seen Evil Dead 2. You saw it last year for Halloween. So that was at the Asta for the, which was great. That was the 4K projection. She was remembering that film while we were watching Army of Darkness. And she's like, oh yeah, I remember that stuff. Despite the prologue in the movie. I'm like, it's not, it's not important. <laughs> you don't need to worry about it. You've seen the prologue. Let's just enjoy the medieval journey. And it's still a film I love. I gave it three and a half stars. I think I gave the director's cut three and a half stars as well, but I imagine I will give that four to four and a half next time I watch it, which it might be soon, actually. I kind of want to get the get the balance right because I'd seen the theatrical, went to the director's cut, logged that on Letterboxd, then I've seen the theatrical cut. Um, I've never loved this film as much as a lot of people do. Again, it's with the Evil Dead films. They're very up in the air. The, the first one is the most horror, and I love it, even for its cheap, low-budget effects. I really love its atmosphere. Um, it's genuinely terrifying. Uh, you you watch the second one, and it's like, it's too much back and forth for me. I do love it. I It's my favorite of the series, but it's so much back and forth. On, it's horror, and it's comedy, and it's horror, and it's comedy. It's a weird balance. Um, it still works. It's just very weird to watch it sometimes. Uh, like, i got to be in the right mind space to watch something that's going to have horror and have comedy and be pronounced in both. Um I think the slapstick works better in the second film anyway, because it's mostly just Bruce Campbell slapping himself. Whereas in the second, in the third film, it's mostly comedy, and then becomes more of a horror with the antics of oh, demons and skeleton army and stuff. And the first half, I don't mind. It's much better in the director's cut, where you actually get expanded dialogue scenes and the romance and whatever. But then the second half, I just love. I, I love when they go off to the. He goes off to the mill, and it suddenly just ramps up into Crazyville. Like, oh look, now there's mini versions of him, and they're all trying to kill him. And you can totally tell which ones were not Bruce Campbell and were stunt doubles. And I still love that about it. And you've got all these things. You've got the mini versions of him. You've got the rear screen projection. You've got all this stuff working together. The miniatures, the giant forks that they use, all this kind of stuff. And the way it blends together, the way they cut the scenery, then him splitting in two. There's a lot of fun stuff about that that I love. But then it gets even better when he's in the graveyard scene and he has to deal with the books and he screws up and he has to deal with the skeletons and then suddenly there's a skeleton army. And I'm like, I love the skeleton army so much. It's my favorite part of maybe any of the Evil Dead films. Like, I love the second film. I love all of them. But I really, really love the skeleton army in the, in the third one. It's just a lot better when you watch the director's cut because there's so much more of it. So I plan to rewatch that very soon. Hopefully. I don't know. I still got to do Jason X. I still got to do the Psycho films. But that was all. That's all for October. It was a hell of a month, obviously. I will probably, when it comes to December, do a tally of what month I watched the most amount of films in. Um, October's getting there, uh, it got there, it was very high, but I don't think it was the most amount I watched, because I think, honestly, I think I kicked, like, January off with, like, 52 films, so, unless I happen to watch more than that, I'll take a look quickly. One, two, uh, I won't count short films or video essays, uh, but I will count documentaries, like, making ofs and stuff, because they're still feature length. Oh my god! I watched 53 goddamn movies, t including the Obsession Revisited um, hour-long doco, about 55 minutes, um, and and the Psycho making of. That's, that's, that's a lot of movies. Holy shit. Well, the rest of the year won't be that busy, probably. I want to watch more TV shows. I want to get into, like, The Shield and, and re-watch X-Files. Uh, this November. Anyway, that's all. Uh, this shirt will be featured in next week's This Weekend. Go check it out when it comes out next week. <laughs> it's a birthday gift. So, yeah, thanks for watching. Um, a long video, but a lot of movies. You can always check out my letterbox down, linked down below and take a look at what I've watched from. Also check out The Saw Come and Relax, to uh, The Romero Come and Relax, both of them, and the uh, Hooptober video as well. So, yeah. Okay, bye. Thanks for watching. See you next month.